Oh, he's shoot up. I think tomorrow morning. And then you come back. What? Next Which time. I heard you didn't even know that was a stage. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. <Is> that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, I'm not getting a lot of response. You're one of you guys. Hey, Garrett, yeah. What do you, you want to get started? You, you just <laughs> <laughs> There's, I'm not just handing this thing uh, out. Not like before. Yeah. We're talking to sign in sheet, Roger. We got it right here. I'm, I am going to sign it and then that's it. No. <laughs> All right, Garrett. Yeah. You, you ready to sit down? Sure. All right, you can stand up if you want, but just don't. Okay. Uh, Okay, Bob's uh, handing out the raffle tickets. Uh, for those of you, if you skip right over you, it's because it's only for Aero Club members. That because the prizes that we're giving away tonight uh, have been paid for by the Air Force, and Air Force says it will only go to Aero Club members. So that's the reason why. Uh, Okay, this is uh, the March Air Force Base Aero Club um, safety meeting that we have once a month. And uh, we do have guests in here also. As many of you know, we have now are part of the WANGS program where you can get credit for, for your WANGS points. Uh, this particular meeting tonight is worth one point for basic and one point for advanced. Uh, the FAA guy gave us the advanced part because of the subject matter that we're talking about tonight. Um, right now, for all of you that are just so antsy about signing this thing, I do have it up here, okay? For you guys who are regular members, you know, you know what to do. Just sign your name, or sign right next to your name. For those of you that are part of the Wings program who are not members of the Aero Club, Right in the back, back here, is the FAA's uh, sign-in sheet that you guys registered for this, uh, for this safety meeting. And of course, you'll find your name on here. All you got to do is put an initial. You don't have to necessarily sign it. They just want you to initial it, and then I'll send in the credit uh, with the FAA. Um, the rest of you who, I know that there's a bunch of you that are registered with the WINGS program. I know because I found out last safety meeting there was a whole bunch of you that signed the WINGS program sheet back here. Uh, it would really help if you would register <laughs> because that way I don't have to sit there and find your name and it does take a little extra time to do it. Register for the meeting? For the meeting, yes. This is officially online with the FAA as a official FAA, you know, uh, WANGS program. And the two gentlemen behind you, they, re they registered. Bob registered. And there's a couple of others. Uh, for those of you that did not officially register online with the FAA, then please sign this right here. And, and not, don't just depend on signing your name next to your name on the Aero Club sheet. Also sign your name on the Wayne's part too. Uh, <coughs> that way you will get credit for it. Uh, keep your eye open. I do send out an email for all these meetings and I do put on there a, an attachment that the FAA puts out with the number that you can register for this meeting. And uh, it really helps me a lot if you actually register. Uh, like these gentlemen did back here, and I, all I have to do is just click on their names and boom, they're in. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for me. So I'm gonna now send this around, and uh, don't forget to sign in at all. So uh, is the meeting over now? No, nope, meeting's not over yet, uh, no. Uh, Mike, I'll start with you. And make sure you get Jerry and the guy behind you. Uh, okay, now, after all of that stuff, um, oh dear, the dead parts messed half of this talk I just did. Uh, okay, contest will be at the end of the meeting for those of you who are anticipating. Um, so, all right, now, 
For you guys who aren't familiar, what we do is we do a certain agenda, and we quickly go through it, and then we actually start the meeting on the lasers, which is what we're talking about tonight. Um, at first, what we do is we introduce new people. These are people that have joined the club recently who have not been introduced before. And I don't see, let's see, I can't, there's so many people out there. Yeah. Stand up. <laughs> and introduce yourself. Yeah. <laughs> introduce yourself, oh, okay. who you are, and why you join the club. So my name is Kaylee Sheehan. I'm here for training for now six months instead of four. Awesome. Um, and I got my private pilot's license not too long before I came here, so I figured, why not use it? Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, and it's my birthday in two days, so I brought cupcakes. <laughs> To do that, so. <laughs> but I haven't gotten one. Are they out now? No. Is there so no, much? there's lots. Oh, oh yeah. okay. <laughs> you forgot the ice cream, though. The ice cream? Oh, well, yeah, where's the ice cream? The milk. <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody else? Okay. All right. Stand up. Mike Allen just joined. Yeah. Yes, he did. did. <laughs> um, I just moved to Redlands and uh, been flying out of Riverside Pilot Flying Club and uh, thought I'd, I'd look at the program here and, and looked really interesting, so I signed up. Prior Navy, uh, F-14 Rio, and uh, hey. last year. <laughs> hey! That's what it is. Next year's rock. That's my story. <laughs> You're going to stick to that right now. Okay. Yeah. Nope, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Joseph Orr. I just joined Friday, a couple of days older than you. Um, I'm a member of the Civil Air Patrol in Brackettville, and I signed up just to get proficient from a low-wing aircraft to a high-wing aircraft. Uh, that's why I'm here. All right. All right. And, and, and of course, you gentlemen that came in for the Wayne's program, you realize I'm going to try to sell you the Aero Club. But you can join the Aero Club if you go if you join the Silver Air Patrol. That's a backdoor way of getting into the Aero Club. But we are a lot cheaper here than everywhere else. Okay. Uh, anybody else? All right. We'll go to new pilot ratings. Anybody have sold recently? I know somebody did. I just don't remember who it was. Check ride next Sunday. Next Sunday. Okay. Yeah. So you still need the cap. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. I just want to point out because I know she won't do it. Yes, I know. Sophie. Sophie. She just soloed. Hey. <laughs> she sure did. It's the pink and white shirt in the briefing room. <laughs> So you know it's Sophie. <laughs> oh, okay, anybody else? I know we had somebody else. Uh, I just uh, passed my oral practical for my, my uh, license to be a mechanic. I got okay. my airframe, wow. car plants next. All and right. uh, I passed my CFI written too. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Randy's going. <laughs> David. Uh, okay, who else? Now this includes, it doesn't have to be Aero Club airplanes, it can be anybody. You know, it can be, you know, Air Force pilots, it can be any, even Marine pilots are allowed to do this. <laughs> okay, well, if that's it, how many of you have gotten the ratings taken away? <laughs> Violated, you know, things like, okay, nobody, all right. Okay, experiences. This is where you get to tell your side of the story of something that happened. Be careful how you talk. Uh, Michael found that out. So, <laughs> uh, anybody that had anything to share with the Aero Club of, and it, again, it does not have to be an Aero Club airplane. It can be anything. You, you guys are commercial airline pilots out there. Can also share anything that happened with you. Uh, <coughs> Anything with lawyers? Confess uh, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, boy, we're pretty slow this month, huh? 
Okay, okay, we'll talk to the Aero Club manager and after him we will go right into laser laser danger. Um, Randy, did you want to go ahead and uh, announce what uh, the events are taking place? Oh, yeah. So, uh, 7 October, Saturday, 7 uh, October, you all know George Watson, uh, Aero Club, long time Aero Club member. He's also airport manager down at Ramona. So, at Ramona on the 7th of October and Saturday, they're having a big fly in. Open air fair, I guess. It's not wavered airspace, um, but it's it's worth going to if you I don't know if a few of you've been there before. But they usually have some pretty cool airplanes to look at. They usually have a big taco wagon and lots of food and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know if Bob wants to call it a flyaway weekend or yeah, yeah it, it'd be a good opportunity to you know get a bunch of Aero Club airplanes headed south, go down there and support it and have a good time. So if you're interested. Uh, I've got a flyer. I'll send. I'll send you the flyer that George gave me, and you can push it out to the Aero Club. But, okay, you can send us some emails. Yeah, I'm not going to be the organizer of this thing, but I'll give you. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. sure. Uh, Robert, did you have something to say? Uh, what day? What, what day? Uh, well, it'll be on Saturday. Saturday. Uh, what day? Would Saturday? you say seven October? Seven October. Seven October. Okay. All right. And uh, let's see. What was I going? How many here? Are, have over 200 flight hours. How many of here are clearing officials? <laughs> ah, see, I saw more hands go up for over 200 hours that say that they are clearing officials. Um, John, stand up. John, John, John is our ops officer. Uh, and he would love to have somebody be a clearing official. Uh, it makes his job a lot easier the more we have. If you're 200 hours and above, you can be a clearing official. What's nice about the clearing official is, is that you get to sign yourself off on the flight plan. You don't have to wait for me, Bob, or one of the instructors or a clearing official. You are the person that can sign yourself off. John does train you. He does an excellent job of doing this. And he tries to get people on that list as much as possible. We just need more okay. uh, more people to you know, be clearing officials. <laughs> We've got to have the, because what, even though you do have to serve a weekend, which basically is just one day, Saturday or Sunday, and that's the time that you can go out and maybe go out and get your $100 hamburger, too. So uh, you only do that one quarter as long as we have enough clearing officials. If we don't, yeah, you may have to pull two times in a quarter. But that's where we need more clearing officials. The more we get, the better it is. That's all I'd really like to say is usually it's just once per three months, uh, Saturday or Sunday. I work with you is when it's convenient for you or when you're not available. Um, if something comes up and you're like, oh, no, I... I'm worried about being out there. Call us, and we'll we'll work around it. Um, it's a great way to contribute to the club. Um, you know, if this is a club. Um, if you're not contributing in some way, this is a great way to do it. Um, so, um, we uh, contact me, uh, and I'll get you checked out. And it's it's a nice thing to have because you can come in here after hours or uh, on the weekends, and you sign yourself out, so you don't need to have uh, uh, someone else signing you off. Appreciate it. Yeah, John is an airline pilot, so he has all kinds of time to work on this. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> all right, uh, unless there's more questions or any more questions, uh, Bob, we need to. Yeah, uh, Last month, uh, the club flew 195 hours the most the club has ever flown. This month we're showing 89 hours, we're almost at the end. So it's like night and day, Mutt and Jeff. Uh, the students that are flying once a week or once every two weeks, you really need to start thinking about where your proficiency is going to go and your learning processes in regards to working towards that private pilot's license. <laughs> You have to think about more. the more you fly, the faster it's going to be. I mean, we're glad to take your money and make this last for two years. 
but we'd like to also see you finish up as fast as possible. So give it some thought. Uh, we're going to need some more time. If we don't hit 110 hours this month, we'll take a loss uh, with the maintenance that we're having doing uh, presently on the aircraft. In the meantime, 03 is out at Mojave for the ADSB and also to install the rear seats for the ICS program on the intercom system. We're getting that done. The next will be 57, then 555, and then 29. And then we're up for a new contract again, and we'll start working on the rest of the airplanes. And it looks like during the winter months we'll probably work on a lot of maintenance. That's for <coughs> slow months because of weather. Although this past month we've had some real interesting weather, including fog and some uh, hot weather and some winds. So we're going to be looking at that. There is a, a, I have a program set up and I've discussed this with a lot of individuals. Um, the next item we're going to be looking at is some upgrades. Uh, the ailerons for the T-34s need to be reskinned. And we'll be doing that one at a time, then followed by painting of the T-34s. And then I'm looking at some more avionics for some of the other aircraft if they cannot approve a new airplane for us. When I say a new airplane, I'm looking at 1978 and above because the ones we're flying are 1968 out of the academy at Colorado Springs. So there is some hope. Uh, I have a, over $130,000 approved by the council for projects that are in the mill. I will have been uh, informed that don't count on that money because we have to see where it's going to come from, even though the kitty has quite a bit of money in it under the uh, welfare program that we have. So my viewpoint is that we get income in, we pay it out, we get income in, we pay it out, and by doing this on a monthly basis or a bi-monthly basis, then we'll take and uh, get the airplanes back in some reasonable shape, which we've been doing since we've got a new change of command here on the base. Colonel Berger is a real active individual. He's a new base commander. Um, he may talk like he's in a ready room and be a little bit blunt on the, on the language, if I can say that. But he's a people's individual, and he's willing to work with everybody, and he has an open door policy. So that looks good for us and uh, everybody else on here. We're going to see some changes and some relaxation and, and some regulations that are going to be pushed to the, right, to the side. Uh, because there's going to be some new vamping going on. So it looks positive for March Air Force Base right now. Uh, as far as maintenance is concerned, uh, don't forget we're having issues still with the type of oil we're using in various airplanes. If you have no idea, look on the little tag that David has put in the uh, connex out there by the uh, gas tank, and it will tell you what airplanes get what kind of oil. Just remember the 2050 in mineral oil only goes in certain airplanes. And it seems like we're using it on some of the other aircraft that shouldn't have it in there. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's a little more costly for us. So the 2050 goes in 5.7, and it goes into the 182. Everything else gets 100 weight, except for 5.6, which has mineral oil. And that mineral oil is in the back end in the baggage compartment. It's always got a couple quarts in the back end. If you get back there and you find a quart that you need to replace that, let us know and we'll replace it. But if we put it in the connex, people just grab the black uh, container, even though it's got a great big M on it, and they put it in the airplane. Not the best, but it's not going to kill it. So help us out and keep it uh, in the logs of what you've used for the airplane, because that gives us an indication of when, this, with, when the engine is getting to a point of, of overhaul. And when I start needing to take uh, oil samples for analysis to see where we're going. And it's your airplanes and your money. And if things continue without doing this, then our costs are going to rise. So if you want to keep the costs down for the Aero Club, help out Roger and I and the maintenance department by keeping us informed of what oil and how much oil is going to each airplane when you bring it in. And just remember, when, there's, when is the best time to see if that engine requires oil in flying? Is it before in pre-flight or is it after pre-flight? The most accurate reading is after pre-flight, isn't it? After we've flown it. That's when you get the true oil reading of any airplane. So if it's down a quart, add it then. Don't add it in the morning because it's going to be down, and then we start it up and we blow it out. I keep my airplane about 10 and a half quarts at all times unless I'm on a cross country, and I fill it to 11. And uh, the same thing with 5.7, uh, 5.5. Five, Ten and a half quarts are about max for that uh, particular aircraft. Whether you have 
the oil tank or you got the wet sump in 5.7. So help us out a little bit and uh, I'd appreciate it. So I'm just going to let us go and we'll get back with our program. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? If not. seriously being lazed. Uh, one of our members here in the club, uh, Dion Worm, he was flying last uh, December with a non-Aero Club airplane. It was an <coughs> airplane that he was flying uh, for his instrument rating uh, out of Palomar. And uh, while flying with his instructor, they got lazed and he was under the hood, so he didn't get the direct shot of it. Uh, he said that he actually, uh, I'll show you the video of it here in a second, but uh, it doesn't look anything really bad, but it was enough to where his instructor, who was, did not have the hood on, of course, uh, kind of lost his night vision, and so Dion had to land the airplane uh, because of that. Uh, here's, here's his video that they, they apparently the school does uh, have a camera that they put on the airplanes. All right, come on. Oh, what else are we supposed to go to? Whoa, whoa. Okay. Whoa, ho, ho. Show me your point, man. Yeah. Hey, uh, sound like I always had a blue wind or illumination at 12 o'clock on the shoreline. Sir, for, uh, three four six five. Okay, that's the still pictures of it there that they extracted off the video. Okay, he said that, he told me uh, that he and his instructor were kind of ignorant about how to report this or what to do. Um, we have had a safety meeting here before just last year on this, 
So uh, I don't remember if he was in the meeting or not, but uh, but there is a certain procedure to do, and that's what we're going to cover primarily. Um, they told him, ATC said that it's possible they could have caught the person. Well, you saw that video just before we got here, and indeed they can catch these people. Um, we actually had a guy out here that was doing this thing, hitting the, um, the C-17s, and apparently he made the mistake of hitting a sheriff's helicopter because they went after him, and they did catch the guy. And you can probably verify that. Yes, sir. It all started actually uh, three months ago. Uh, I'm Paul Burst, I'm the air traffic commander here. Uh, it started about three months ago in May. Uh, they raised uh, the star helicopter, the sheriff patrol. He uh, couldn't, it was in the Menifee Sunset area, just uh, behind Stater Brothers, uh, okay. the, right there. So they had an ongoing investigation with uh, the FBI, uh, the FAA, and SWAT. Uh, so with all we had, a, I think, was it 16 events by this guy or more, I think, over four yeah. months. One night in May, he hit four aircraft. He had a 17, 135, a P-3, and a Cirrus, all in the same area on base lake by Canyon Lake. But long story short, on August 23rd, he finally screwed up, and uh, he's now somebody's friend in jail. But he's been apprehended. Uh, and uh, last I heard from uh, Special Agent Law of the FBI and uh, Corporal Fitzgerald of the uh, Riverside Sheriff that he's Basically, three to five years. So, any information you can give us, uh, lat longs, uh, crossing streets, everything, we have a uh, in radar. Well, we have a hotline directly to with, with 911, but they're pretty good at it now and they're pretty proficient at it. So, all the details. It takes a little while, but we finally did get this. Yeah. That's all. Uh, thank you. That was perfect because that's just what I needed. The. Uh, what, what they want you to do, well, actually, ATC treats this just like an emergency, in fight emergency. And uh, for you as a pilot, you also want to treat it the same way. You don't want to just be very light on this. Uh, while maintaining aircraft control, look away from the source. Uh, they keep, of course, talking about, and you'll see it on here on the slides, they keep talking about put your pilot, your airplane in autopilot. Well, most of us don't have that. So, you know, especially in this, on our airplanes here. Uh, a fancy airplane like Bob, I think, does. But uh, the, um, the FBI is getting pretty serious with this, and so they're getting more and more involved with these things. Um, Within the U.S., the FBI is in charge of the investigations of all lazy reports. So your report to ATC is very, very, very critical. Uh, be as detailed as possible. We'll get into that in just a couple of seconds. Okay. As everybody knows, we have lasers everywhere. There's all kinds of legitimate way, uh, lasers. Uh, in 1995, the there was a lot of complaints about lasers hitting airplanes, and not necessarily on purpose. It was just because, you know, how many here have seen the, the light shows, you know, in, in these different places? I mean, you know, they're really beautiful. I mean, it's really neat. But the problem is, is that there were some airplanes that got affected by it. So what they did is that the FAA revised uh, Order 7400.2, Part 6, Miscellaneous Procedures. And they call it outdoor laser operations. And they revised the orders to establish exposure limits for airports. And basically, uh, not to get into all the details in terms of the technical stuff, but uh, they limit the, how much a, an official event can have their lasers within a proximity of an airport. And, uh, this right here is just a side view of that, and you can see down at the bottom where the runway is, and they have a place where it's a laser-free zone where they don't allow it at all. Uh, and then you got the critical flight zone, which is about 10, it looks like 10 nautical miles out from the center of the airport, where they can only have up to uh, five uh, uh, micro, yeah, micro watts. And, then you've got the sensitive flight zone, which is 100. 
and so forth, and then as it gets further out. Uh, this order that they put out, uh, FAA Order 7400.2, uh, pretty much took care of the problems from official light shows. Uh, I know that I can remember a couple of times on some of these rock concerts, there was some issues that came up. But for the most part, it pretty much set that standard so that they won't get the airplanes affected. Uh, however, as everybody knows, you got a lot of people that like to break the rules. And of course, you got people that ignore these rules. And so therefore, uh, we have the problem with people deliberately on purpose lazing your airplane. Uh, the handheld lasers, like the one that mine broke before I could come here in the class, because uh, I was going to laze everybody with it. Um, it's a, you know, those little ones aren't supposed to be more than, let's see, what is it? It's not, uh, they're one to five milliwatts is the, is the max that they're supposed to be. Anything above five milliwatts, then they have to be registered, or at least they're supposed to be used for only professional type things. However, as everybody knows who has Amazon, you can buy just about anything, whether it's legal or not. Uh, well, yeah, it's on a gray area. I mean, obviously, if you buy a 500 milliwatt uh, laser, I mean, you know, they're not going to stop you because it's not against the law. But, you, you know, it depends on what you're using it for. I guess some people use it to search stars. Uh, how many of you know about that? I've had a few people, yeah. I've had people tell me about that, and so I guess they use it for that. And so you have to really be careful, and they get a, they get pretty strong, I guess. Uh, the problem is, is that lasers have become less and less as far as expense. You can almost buy them pretty cheap. Uh, it's not something that's really, uh, you know, even poor people can do it like us, you know. Um, so it's not just for only big conglomerates or people who are big, you know, making millions of dollars. It can be anybody. All right, this is a little video that we have. It's about 10 minutes long. This originally was 21 minutes long. Uh, this is from done with the FAA. You were landing. Suddenly, a bright green flash lights up your cockpit and interferes with your vision. You have just witnessed a laser illumination. What do you do? Laser strikes bring risk to the air crew and their passengers because any laser strike can have adverse effects on the vision of the air crew and potentially their ability to safely fly the aircraft. One way to mitigate the risks presented by laser exposures is through education and training of air crew so they are prepared to successfully handle a laser event. The FAA and the U.S. Air Force have been working together to study the effects of laser exposures on aircrew. They have prepared this video to increase aircrew awareness of cockpit laser incidents. Now to give us a pilot's perspective, here is retired L-1011 Delta Airlines pilot, Captain Bill Connor, Ph.D. Well, our incidents in this country are a lot more common than, than people are aware of through the news media. Uh, for the last six months, we've had over 300 incidents in this country alone, and since 2004, we've had 1,700 incidents. Both airplanes and helicopters have been targeted, usually during the most critical phases of flight, approach, landing, and takeoff. Lasers are a threat to air safety, and steps have been taken by several countries, including the U.S., to enact legislation defining penalties for purposefully illuminating aircraft and to punish individuals who do so with fines and or jail time. In fact, several states in Australia have banned laser pointers and imposed mandatory jail time for possession without a lawful reason. Most laser incidents are believed to be nuisance or pranks and primarily involve laser pointers. Nearly everyone knows what laser pointers are. They are handheld devices used to point to objects projected on a screen during a presentation. They are also used outdoors to point out objects in the night sky. The most common laser colors are green and red, 
but other colors are also available. Most of the laser incidents have occurred in the early evening between 7 and 11 p.m., or at dusk and at night. Lasers pose the highest flight risk at night because the dark adapted eye is many times more sensitive to light, and the laser is much brighter relative to the background than during the day. What makes a laser potentially dangerous is the amplification of light by the optics of the eye. Even a laser pointer emitting just 5 milliwatts can appear blindingly bright. Other factors that contribute to how dangerous a laser can be are how powerful the laser is, which roughly equates to its brightness, its wavelength, which we already know favors green lasers, how long the exposure is, how much the beam diverges or spreads out, and the distance from the laser. The hazards to the air crew are primarily to the retina of the eye, not the skin, the airframe, or avionics. The laser strikes on air crew occur at distances that are well beyond the hazard distances for skin. As for the airframe, the only lasers currently capable of causing damage are military lasers that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and that are still in development. The effects that visible lasers can have on the eye and vision range from nothing more than the appearance of a bright light to severe and permanent physical damage to the eye. In the scenario of cockpit laser illuminations, permanent physical damage to the eye is highly unlikely. The lasers involved in cockpit laser strikes, for the most part, will not cause physical damage to the eye due to variables such as length of exposure, intensity, and or proximity. On the other hand, even lasers no more powerful than laser pointers are very capable of causing non-permanent visual effects that include startle, distraction, glare, and flash blindness. It is the visual effects that lasers can produce that are the greatest threat to air crew. The first effect is the sudden appearance of a bright light. Let's see that again. Note that the runway is still visible. However, an event like this when unexpected may cause a startle response that can distract the pilot, even if the light is not bright enough to cause significant glare. Also, the fact a bright light appeared unexpectedly may generate fear that an even brighter light may be coming. In this example, the light is being flashed intermittently. This is typical of most laser strikes on cockpits because as we showed earlier, it is very difficult to maintain a small beam on a small moving target at long distances. As laser intensity increases, glare can become a problem. Glare is an obscuration of vision that is like a veil of light placed over part of the visual scene. Glare is present only while the laser is on. The amount of area obscured will depend on the intensity of the laser light. It will also depend on its color. As stated before, green light is more effective than red or blue light in stimulating the visual system. Therefore, a green laser of the same power as a red laser will create more glare. As laser intensity and glare increase, a point is reached where the eye can no longer respond normally when the laser is turned off. The result is a phenomenon called flash blindness. Flash blindness is a temporary loss of vision that continues after a laser is turned off. After the exposure, there is an after image that varies in size and duration depending on the level of exposure and color of the laser. The effect is similar to what occurs after exposure to a camera flash only it can be much greater in magnitude and duration. Even so, recovery time of functional vision is usually rapid. The after images lose strength quickly and can be seen through even though they may persist for several minutes. This illustrates safety distances for the visual effects from a green laser pointer of maximum legal power of 5 milliwatts. As you can see, it is extremely unlikely that a pointer could cause eye damage. The pointer would have to be within 50 feet of the pilot and maintained in focus on one spot on the retina for several seconds. Even though damage is unlikely, a laser pointer can produce the other visual effects at significant distances. The effects vary with range, with the strongest effect, flash blindness, occurring at the closest range. How can I tell I am being illuminated by a laser? The most obvious distinction is that the laser light is of one bright color. The most common colors are green and red as shown here. In contrast, searchlights, spotlights, and the landing lights of other aircraft are white in appearance. Besides educating pilots, the FAA and the Department of Defense 
are also conducting research to better understand laser effects on pilot performance and to develop procedures to minimize the effects. Working together, they have outfitted a 737 simulator with both red and green lasers that track realistically as the aircraft maneuvers. All of the in-the-cockpit scenes in this video were shot in this simulator. The outcome of this research has discovered that pilots subjected to laser events quickly learn the extent of the visual effects from exposures and how to work around them, even in the most challenging flight situations. A couple of things that the pilot should uh, remember when they're illuminated, the uh, laser illumination, is do not rub your eyes. Do not look into the beam. That's in areas that you can immediately help resolve some of the problem. If you can't look away from it, shield your eyes. Look down at your flight instruments. Turn your background lights up. This is a problem that some pilots have experienced to where they have been illuminated, they haven't been able to shield their eyes quickly enough, and they haven't been able to see their background lights on their uh, instruments. Don't leave them down. Turn them up. Some of the things you do want to do is get your autopilot on, communicate with the other pilot to transfer control of the aircraft, and to ascertain you know, which one has the best visibility at the time. Make sure that you've contacted the tower. Make sure that you have control base for you to go fly into while you're resolving your vision impairment problems. And also check uh, your aircraft because during this time of the visual uh, impairment, you may have been in a turn or in an unusual uh, uh, configuration. You want to be able to reestablish a normal profile of the airplane. So this is why it's important to get your autopilot on so it'll help restabilize the airplane while you're checking out what are the configurations that the aircraft is in now and what you are returning to. So do make sure that you communicate and communications is probably one of the most important things you can do. Laser illumination should not evoke startle, and the information in this video should be used to guide an appropriate response. Help the FAA by reporting these incidents per the FAA Advisory Circular 70-2. Additional information may be obtained from these web addresses listed on the screen. Okay, um, some of the, as you can see, part, most of this was, of course, aimed towards larger aircraft that has crews and stuff, but it also, of course, is aimed at us, too. We just fly the smaller airplanes. Um, the reaction's still the same. Uh, unfortunately, if you're in your airplane by yourself, now, of course, you're going to have to deal with that. And that could be a problem, but then again, there's some techniques in there that they brought up in the video that you could use also. Um, let me just run through some of them. Um, on January 12, 2005, uh, five, they, uh, FAA came out with, uh, our Department of Transportation came out with a advisory circular 70-2 uh, reporting of laser illumination of aircraft. Uh, this is out you can get online to see it um, that's what it looks like right there this one here is the later one this is uh, came out february 8 2013 just uh what three years ago now and uh <clears throat> it's a little more updated uh, the big thing about this thing is i i would highly recommend that you read this thing because it gives you pretty much kind of the same stuff that we just saw in this video uh, no matter what kind of airplane you fly. Um, the, uh, again, they reemphasize in this AC here that treat it like an in-flight emergency. Okay? That's one of the things you want to do. And then doing so, that means you need to get old ATC. You need to announce to people what's going on. Um, the increase of lasers, of course, uh, you know, he gave a little bit. This it's actually a little bit higher now, but a 300 percent increase from 2005 to 2008. Now, some of that increase obviously could be because uh, the pilots are more aware of the problem. Uh, 
But I also believe that it has to do with the fact that people, anybody can buy them now. Uh, they become very inexpensive, as I, I stated earlier. Uh, what was marked originally as laser pointers, uh, they have a power from 1 to 5 uh, milliwatts. And uh, usually, you know, as you saw in this video, they showed you what a 5 milliwatt uh, laser hit looks like. And, you know, it can disrupt things, and especially in our airplane, because for one thing, in a T-41 or a T-34, or any other of Bob's A36, uh, we're going a lot slower than a lot of your larger aircraft, so the chances of them being able to hit us and our airplane is a little bit higher. Yeah, we're smaller, but we're a lot slower. And a lot depends, of course, you know, where this individual is, what they're doing, where, who they're looking at. I know that sometimes these people, they want to get that big airplane, you know, out there. But we, like what happened to Dion out there in Oceanside,